Hi friends, I want to welcome you to this uh, session that we're having today on Friday, May 22nd. Uh, I'm glad that you can be with us as we worship God, as we study the scripture, and as we raise our prayers. And I'd like to begin today as we affirm our faith through our confession of the Apostles' Creed, uh, the Lord's Prayer, and Martin Luther's Morning Prayer. Please join me at this time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we join together in the prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And finally, if you'd please join me in Martin Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Today we're going to be picking up uh, towards the middle or end of chapter 17 of Acts, and we're going to carry on through uh, most of chapter uh, 18. Uh, and I'd like to uh, invite you into this study with me, but I'd, I'd like to begin with just a brief review. So after their first mission trip of Paul and and Barnabas trip, and the Council of Jerusalem has taken place. And the Council of Jerusalem, of course, had a very favorable and, and lenient leaning towards the uh, Gentile converts, in which they released those Gentile converts from a strict adherence to the Jewish laws and traditions. Now Paul and Barnabas had uh, apparently together kind of decided, hey, let's go back and revisit those churches that we planted uh, on our first trip. Uh, but as they were considering this, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them, and Paul was just firmly against that. John Mark, we remember, had uh, left that early mission trip uh, when they reached Perga and sailed back to Jerusalem. And Paul, for some reason, perhaps he felt like John Mark uh, couldn't be counted on to complete the mission or that he had uh, left them uh, somewhat in the lurch on their first mission. Uh, he was not willing to take him. So Barnabas said, okay, well, here's what. I'll take John Mark with me and we'll sail east to Cyprus. And then Paul took Silas with him and they headed by the land route up north towards uh, Lystra in Derby. And thus they accomplished some of the things that they had uh, set out to do, but they did it separately and they did it with different uh, mission partners at this point. Uh, I'd also note that uh, as, as this is going to uh, narrate mostly Paul's trip with Silas, uh, what we're going to find is that the pattern is very clear. They'll enter into a town. They'll speak first typically at the synagogue with uh, somewhat of a preference for the Jewish people in the town presenting their message. At first, they will seem to be 
uh, well received by both the Gentiles uh, that are worshiping at the Jewish synagogue as well as the Jews there. Uh, but then what will happen is uh, as they get going, leaders from other towns uh, from the uh, Jewish uh, faith will come in and they'll somewhat undermine the, uh, the progress that Paul has made in spreading the Christian faith. And so uh, then they'll move on to the next place and then the leaders from that place will typically, after they get started in uh, their, uh, their message that they're proclaiming, those leaders will send in people who will once again undermine or stir up the crowds against them. And this will be uh, something of a pattern that will happen over and over again as they're going. Although I, I, I would also mention that sometimes the local people, the Gentiles, people that maybe have nothing to do, in fact, often have nothing to do with the, the Jewish faith, uh, they're uh, perhaps um, pagan uh, or uh, they, they worship many gods. And so uh, they'll sometimes hear the message and it will uh, run a counter to their philosophies. And sometimes it will uh, be disruptive to their financial goals and their financial business. And so they'll sometimes come out and uh, stir up uh, the crowds themselves against Paul and Silas in their teaching. So just before our story kicks in today, we'll remember that Paul had been in Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, there was one of these kinds of riots that uh, rise up against him. And he's forced to flee down towards Berea. When they're in Berea, they're at first again, well received. And then the leaders from Thessalonica, they send people down and they're causing a disturbance there. So the people of Berea send Paul and, and Silas and, and Timothy is with them now too off towards the coast to kind of lay low, I think, a little bit. Timothy and Silas decide that what they're going to do is they're going to stay there for a while, but Paul is ushered down south further to Athens, uh, where he's going to uh, meet up then with Silas and Timothy uh, when they uh, finally come down to meet him. So that's kind of where we're at in our reading. At this time, then, I'd like to begin with the 17th chapter, the 16th verse. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogues with the Jews and devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated him. And it, just in a short note, uh, I, I found in my study Bible, it, it mentioned that the Epicureans would uh, ridicule religious enthusiasm and they argued against any fear of death and divine judgment. While the Stoics, they believed that we should live in accord with nature, uh, and they believed that in order to do this, uh, we would be ruled over by divine logos, if you will, divine logos. Logos is a word we're familiar with in the beginning of John. Uh, in the beginning was the word, and that word is logos. Uh, the word uh, means reason. Uh, it means the, uh, the message of, and so uh, it, here divine logos is that that divine word or that divine reason, and that's what the Stoics would have adhered to, although not in the, the way that perhaps John was uh, uh, wanting us to think of it. And they thought that the way then to uh, get in tune with nature and live in accord with nature was to allow our, our reason and our self-control uh, to guide us. So these are some of the uh, philosophers then are, that are debating with Paul. I'll go back a little bit to that first. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign deities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And, and another note in my study Bible pointed out that uh, there was a female deity uh, worshipped by some people in that area at that time that was called uh, resurrection uh, with a capital R. So uh, she was uh, uh, one of the, the deities that people might follow. And so they may have been misinterpreting Paul's message and thinking that he was proclaiming uh, Jesus and his companion, 
uh, resurrection uh, rather than Jesus and this event that had taken place uh, in his life through the grace and power of God. So they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus, and the Areopagus may have been a, a hill or a, a place where people could uh, gather to debate things. So then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For I went through your city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship. I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our beings, as even some of your own poets have said. For we too are his offspring. Now this, uh, we too are his offspring, was a, uh, a quote from Aratus, uh, who was a, a third century uh, before Christ poet. And he goes on. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, We will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them. But some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysus the Areopagite and a woman named Demarius and others with them. Now, now here, just to be uh, fair, I want to interject that uh, Paul may have been painting uh, something of an oversimplistic picture of what it meant to uh, have idols and to worship idols. Uh, there's a couple ways of thinking about it. Uh, for some, it's the idea that we're actually worshiping this this thing, this this lump of uh, gold or this silver uh, lump or this image uh, that we've got in our hand. Uh, but and and you know what? Some people, in their superstitious uh, manner, may have actually been doing that, but it was probably uh, more that the people would look at that idol as an image or a, a symbol of this other god uh, that they were worshiping. Uh, and, of course, in the, uh, the, the Christian and the Jewish uh, faith tradition, as well as in the uh, Islamic faith tradition, uh, any other god, uh, is, is wrong to worship. We're a, a, a faith that believes in one true God and that we worship that God and that God only. So it might be that Paul was painting this, this uh, overly simplistic picture, but he was still getting at the heart of the issue, which was uh, that we ought not to be worshiping any other God than the one true God. I also want to mention about Paul's um, a sermon or, or his discussion or his conversation there in the Areopagus, that we find some important things about the way that Paul would uh, spread his message to those that were around him. First of all, we find that he's not initially striking out by condemning them, uh, putting them down or throwing insults at them. He finds that which is something that they are uh, both 
uh, feeling positive about. Uh, he praises them uh, pretty much for the fact that they are a very religious people, and he finds uh, a platform for them to uh, both be uh, on a good footing. And then as he moves, his message kind of evolves and becomes a, a little bit more uh, nuanced. And eventually then he'll come to his point. But he starts by being on uh, a good standing with them. He's not uh, putting them down. He's not saying, hey, you're going to hell, period, and it's all done. He's saying, look, you know, you've got these things going for you, and now I'm going to take this this one uh, altar that I saw, it said, to the, the unknown God. Let me tell you a little bit about that uh, God that may be a little bit less known in these parts. And he starts telling them the, uh, his message, and eventually, because he's gone in this manner, there are some that are open uh, to hearing him and even become believers along with him. Not everyone, of course, but some do. At this point, then, I'd like to move on and continue our reading in the 18th chapter now of Acts. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogues and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with proclaiming the word, testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him in protest, he shook the dust from his clothes and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. And we remember that a worshiper of God was a person who was a Gentile, but had been experiencing and worshiping and seeking God uh, through the Jewish faith. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the official of the synagogue, became a believer in the Lord, together with all his household. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul became believers and were baptized. One night, the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to harm you, for there are many in this city who are my people. He stayed there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. They said, this man is persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of crime or serious villainy, I would be justified in accepting the complaint of you Jews. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourself. I do not wish to be judge of these matters. And he dismissed them from the tribunal. Then all of them seized Sosthenes, the official of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of these things. After staying there for a considerable time, Paul said, farewell to the believers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. At Sencrie, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there. But first, he himself went into the synagogue and had a discussion with the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Sancrie, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from place to place through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. And that's where I'd like to end for today.
So what we've seen then is Paul and Silas and, and Timothy now with them, taking their message boldly from place to place. They enter the place, uh, they, they begin to preach or proclaim their message. Often people come in and are disruptive or, or trying to uh, sometimes even have them put in jail or, or persecuted in some way. But they, they keep up with that task, even if it means taking it then to the next place and the next place and the next place. And what they're doing then is planting the seed and they're starting up these churches and they're encouraging the people uh, as they go. And this has take them on, uh, taken them on really a, a quite a journey uh, as they've gone about to uh, preach this word. And it's because of this really uh, that we have a, a direct link to the uh, the mission that the Paul and Silas and and Barnabas and John Mark and and all those other apostles and early Christians uh, had set in place uh, that that process has led to the fact that our faith uh, is in tune with the teachings that that they set out in in those early days and so we give thanks to them for the work that they've done. At this time, then, I'd like to invite you to join me in our closing prayer for this morning. Lord God, we do give you thanks for the, the love and the, the grace that's been shared with us through the, the chain of uh, apostles and teachers and missionaries and evangelists who went out to share your word, sometimes uh, putting themselves in grave danger as they did. We thank you for their persistence for their confidence and for the, the grace and the power that you gave them through the Spirit that uh, brought the message to us uh, that we too could share in the hope, uh, the joy, and the peace uh, that the message uh, of Christ's love uh, has spread to us. God, today we continue to lift you those who are on our hearts and in our minds as we consider those who are perhaps ill or lonely or frightened or have other troubles in their lives and problems. And, and so we lift you today, Jim and Jacob and Chet and Sherry and Sasha and Sophie and Shirley and John and Vince and Bob. We raise to you Marge and Steve and Denny, Selim and Inez, Marie and Jean and Wilma, Donna, Elaine, Marcia, Joe, Kim, and Cheryl, Cecilia, Myrtle, and Irene. And along with these, Lord, we lift you all who are in our hearts and on our minds, and we raise these prayers to you just privately, but knowing that you attend to our prayers and that you're compassionate and powerful. God, we pray for all people everywhere. We pray for those in our community and in our world. We pray that uh, we will continue to follow the safety and health precautions that are put in place for us. We pray that we do this, if not for our own health and safety, we do it for the safety and health of those that we love as an act of our, our loving kindness. We pray that you will watch over all first responders, all medical professionals, nurses, clinical practitioners. We pray that you'd be with those who are nurses, aides, and doctors, and, and all those people that work in the hospitals and clinics, the custodians and the, the, the lab technicians and all those people, that you'd watch over them and, and keep them protected. And we give you thanks for the job that they're doing. And, and uh, outside of the medical profession as well, we pray for those who are working in grocery stores and post offices and, and banks and those who are uh, delivering our mail and our packages and uh, delivering freight and all those jobs that uh, just have to keep going in order for uh, our basic needs to be met. We thank you for the, the risks that uh, many of these people are taking on a daily basis. And we pray that you would protect them and that you would fill our hearts with gratitude for the jobs that they're doing. We continue lifting to you those who are suffering financially from the impacts of this virus. And particularly, we pray for the poorest and most marginalized among us in our communities, those who have the least uh, give in their 
um, in their finances and in their budgets, the, the least amount of ability to take on extra burdens at this time. And we pray that compassionate aid would be given to them, that they might continue to uh, live with hope and confidence and health. Lord, we pray for all those with concerns that are not at all related to this virus. We pray for those with family and, and marriage issues. We pray for those with mental health issues. We pray for those with physical health issues. We pray for all those who have work-related problems and those that have any number of, of other things on their minds and in their hearts. We especially pray for those who are anxious and lonely, afraid, and those who grieve. We ask that you would bring your peace and your hope and your confidence to all people, that they would know that peace and they would grasp that it comes through you and through a faith in your love and your power. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I do thank you for joining me for this time of prayer and study, and I do pray that you'll have a wonderful day today. I, I look forward to it, and I look forward to uh, the next time that we can get together. Uh, it's Friday today, so we'll have a worship video coming out on Sunday, and then uh, we'll be back to our Bible study and prayers on Monday. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend, and I'll look forward to uh, being with you again uh, this coming Monday. God bless.